Dr. K.E. Holmes. And, uh, oh my, email somebody, text somebody. We're going to look at perfect peace today. Now, our, our scripture that we're coming from is Isaiah 26. But for those of you that are familiar with me, with me, you know that I am a theologian. And so there's some theological things going on here in this Isaiah 26, 3, that we're taking this from perfect peace. And I'm going to give you those things so that you understand a magnitude of what God would have you to know. And I mean to be ingrained in, to be rooted in, to be grown in, to be spread in, to be comforted in, to be empowered in, to be emboldened in, all of that, all of that, all of that perfect peace. Because when we think about peace, a lot of times we think about stillness. And that's part of it. And it's part of it in the right situation at the right time. But oh my, let's look at the, let's look at the verse that we're going to take it from. But I'm warning you, buckle your seatbelt, because I'm going to give you some theological stuff that's not just school and college and Sunday school and the commentaries. And I love all of that. Absolutely love it all but in the context in which God gives a thing, because that's the only way that the thing is right. Now, I'm going to read to you Isaiah 26, 3, and keep coming back to that, and mostly that's for me, so that I know where I want to bring you um, grounded in for this time. But I'm going to give you a whole lot of things, and I'm going to give you some precepts that came before Isaiah was ever even here. Okay, but uh, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So you see, there's several components in there. And um, we need to to not do some habits that we have uh, with the word of God to just shorten some things and just say some things without the rest of the that goes with it. Um, thou will keep him in perfect peace. God doesn't just automatically keep you at perfect peace. There's a whole lot of times when we love him, he loves us, and our peace is all messed up because we're not trusting in him. So the prerequisite of this is who's, because he trusteth in thee, whose mind is stayed on thee. And I gave it to you backwards uh, because the last thing he says about that is because, but the first thing is whose mind is stayed on thee. So you have to have your mind arrested by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, by Elohim, the Spirit of Elohim. Uh, And I'm going to tell you some things over and over and over so that we get them in the many applications that it is for the different things that we live out in life and the different people that we encounter in life. And that's whether we, we, that it's things that we like or things that we don't like, things we understand, things we don't understand. But all things are according to the counsel of his will. All things are according to what he's ordained in his son, Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Everything is according to his law, to his word, to his way, to what he has established, not just to what he's revealed to us, not just to what he's prophesied to us, not just to what we understand at any given time. And I do want you to know that when God gives us revelation, it tends to fill us up. We tend to be filled with that revelation of what he's given, even if it's just what I call a thumbnail full. Uh, it, it fills us, but it's not all the fullness of the counsel of God. But he is pleased to fill us with the revelation of himself, his will, his purpose, so that we can move in what he's given, so that we can have fruit in what he's given and what he's doing, so that we can uh, be without misunderstanding when we're in right standing. And so many things are going through my mind. So I want you to see, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now understand, it's God who's going to keep him in perfect peace. It's the Father. 
You see, we have a lot of things that we can do to keep ourselves in peace. I was having a, a rough few days that I was discouraged about some things and I could hear it in my own voice other than hear it in my own spirit. And I know that if I'm sounding like that, then I am ministering that. You know how 1 Corinthians uh, 14, it tells us that there's no sound without signification. We're right now um, still in that time of wanting to blow the shofar. And for those who have really dedicated and studied, you know that there are certain sounds that you do with the shofar, and it gives certain messages. Those things God ordained first, and then there's some others that the Israelites, uh, God's people, uh, did and got approved. God said, okay, it'll be like that. Kind of like the book of Esther, that it, uh, Mordecai had a, had a uh, writing, and Esther had a writing, and they took it before the Sanhedrin. They took a vote, and God approved what they had decided on as to which one was going to be word, word of God, and which things were going to be the practice that God has approved. Now they, okay, do you understand? Mordecai, her uncle, he wrote an account. Esther, she wrote an account. Mordecai wanted his account to be for what the Jews follow and what they commemorate. Esther wanted it to be entered into the word and what people commemorate and what the Jews commemorate. And they took it to a vote, very like what we see with the apostles as to what are we going to do now that, that um, uh, the, the, the thief is gone, now, now that the betrayer killed himself, he hung himself. Now that, now that we're 11 and not 12, and we know that God has ordained the 12, what are we supposed to do? And they voted. And while God approved the vote, God already knew he had Paul in the wings, uh, born out of time. But when we move forward on the things that God has given, he'll approve. And then he'll show us a thing or two. So I want you to see that it is God who keeps him. It is Well, actually, here again, here I go being the theologian. Now, I love King James because most of the commentaries, the oldest commentaries, uh, the commentaries that are off of King James tend to be more accurate uh, for the times and for the seasons. And I like to let you know that when you see the, I, the word in italics, it's not in the actual text. Now, that's not to trip you up and it's not for bad translation. It's to make the language flow better because without it, listen to how it sounds. Just the sound. Remember, there is no sound without signification. Thou wilt keep in perfect peace mine stayed because he trusteth in thee. And I'm not so sure about the in thee. I don't have my, my Hebrew uh, copy with me here right now. But you understand we need the hymn so that you understand who God is talking about. But it's not in the text. Because the emphasis is on the fact that it's God and he does the keeping. That, And as a matter of fact, it may not even be God, it may be Lord. You see, when we see God in our Bibles, it's usually Elohim. Sometimes it's El, usually Elohim. But when we see Lord, it's Yahweh, God of covenant. Some of you like the name Jehovah. I'm not going to go into why it's not Jehovah. That was an error made, in an honest mistake that went on for a couple hundred years before we knew it was a mistake. And so we got to like the name Jehovah, and some of us still really like it. But I want you to understand that when God first revealed the name Yahweh, he didn't reveal it first as by itself. He revealed it as Yahweh Elohim. And there were some things that he wanted to get across to us about that. So that by the time Isaiah comes along, we understand that Yahweh, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your English Bibles, is Yahweh. But we have a whole body of things that we understand when God is talking to us as Yahweh. And the next verse, he lets us know that trust ye in the Lord, Yahweh. Trust ye in Yahweh forever. For in Yahweh, 
and your English Bible will say, for in the Lord Jehovah, because there's a double emphasis there, and, and so the translators sought to give it. As a matter of fact, I believe this is the one that it's, uh, it's Yah, Yahweh. God gives a double emphasis on that. Uh, but I want to deal with this perfect peace because he wants you to understand who is talking, who's doing the keeping, and who, who is in charge here. Because there are times in the scripture where he tells you, you need to do some things. You need to resist the devil. You need to read the word. You need to stand on his promises. Uh, what happened here? Uh, my thing jumped out, out from where the scripture is. There are times when he wants you to know that you have some responsibility. But here he puts the responsibility on himself. Because... There are times and circumstances that are so out of your control, so out of your understanding, and so outside of your, your experience. And God will still keep you. And pardon me, I want to say what he said. Elohim is not what he said there. He said Yahweh. When God says God, he means God. When he says Yahweh, he means Yahweh. And here he's letting us know Yahweh. Now, Yahweh is the God of covenant. The God who ratifies the covenant. The God who keeps the covenant. No matter what you do or don't do, he knows what the whole covenant is. He hasn't forgotten any piece of it. And he will keep every part of it. And he will keep the specifics. And right now, this verse is talking about he will keep you in perfect peace. And there are some references to that. Now, some things you need to understand about this perfect peace is whether you're in control or whether you're out of control, God is always in control. And what you want to know, Isaiah 26, 3, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now, don't go saying God will keep him in perfect peace like we do the, what is that scripture that says uh, we like to sing it, we like to say it, that he won't put more on you than what you can bear. That is totally not true by itself. The rest of that says, lest you make a way of escape. When things are more than what you can bear, God has made a way of escape. And if we just take it that he won't put more on you than you can bear, you will sometimes try to take a weight that will break you, that will destroy you, that will encumber you, and not look for the way of escape. I remember when I was in college, I used to like to tell the uh story of, of the man who was on a ship or he was drowning and and uh, uh, God sent a boat and he said no I'm, I'm believing the Lord I'm waiting on the Lord and then God sent a helicopter and and uh, he the helicopter people said come on come on we're coming to rescue you he said no I'm waiting on the Lord I'm waiting on the Lord and I forget what else was sent I think uh, and anyway you get the gist so he died he drowned and in heaven he opened up his eyes and he'd be like, God, I was waiting on you. Why didn't you save me? And, he, and they used to tell this in school. Well, I sent you a boat and you said no. I sent you a helicopter and you said no. And so, hi, 
welcome to the <laughs> eternal kingdom. But, um, and that's, that's a funny joke and it's not funny, but because it is what we do. We get so set in a certain scripture we know or a certain doctrine we know, and we don't know some other things. Remember Samuel, his wife, I mean, Samuel's parents, pardon me. Samuel's wife had a visitation from the angel of the Lord. And here again, I'm a theologian. Sometimes you study the angel of the Lord and it's the Lord himself. Other times you study the angel of the Lord and it's, it's kind of like the Lord's right hand messenger. And in this one, because he took worship, you know that it is the Lord himself. And uh, here again, Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, God of covenant. So God's entering into covenant. And remember, Samuel was born with a covenant concerning his hair. He, and, uh, but what I want to show to you is whether you understand or whether you misunderstand, God still understands and he still knows what he's doing. And he's still doing what he's doing no matter what it is the world understands, the doctrine that's understood, the people understood or misunderstood. He's still about his eternal purpose. He's still absolutely good. He is still utterly faithful. And like that man that I'm believing God, I'm believing God, I'm waiting on the Lord, I'm waiting on the Lord. But he couldn't recognize when God sent a boat and he couldn't recognize when God sent a helicopter. And uh, so he died. You see, now the example that I'm giving you about Samuel, uh, Samuel's parents, Samuel's wife, she had been barren. Now she gets an, a visitation from the angel of the Lord and when she told her husband what was going on, he said, ah, we're going to die, we're going to die. Nobody sees God live. Well, that's a truism. But, we, but the world, as well as the religious world, misunderstood that and took it to places that God doesn't take it. Or the angel of the Lord, as she, she told her husband, well, if that was so, he wouldn't to tell me that he's going to do this. You know, so there was a misunderstanding across the entire world across the entire entire religious world, including God's people, including the ones he was talking to. God knew that they misunderstood, and he still knew that he still called out Samuel. He's still going to do what he's going to do on Samuel, and even in his life, so many things were misunderstood, misacted on. But you see, Yahweh, God of covenant, is still ratifying his covenant. Even when he acted the fool and couldn't keep himself uh, sexually and, and uh, uh, seemed to think that he had the rights because that's how the world believed at that time, God still kept covenant and still kept him. And then when he went so far that the consequences were that he lost his strength because he went outside of the covenant and got himself tricked up so that, that his hair was cut off. And that was part of the covenant. You see, now if you don't know the covenant, if you're not reading the word, you're a royal priesthood. I hope you know that. When you're in Jesus Christ, you're part of the royal priesthood. That's the royalty and the priesthood that are counted. And if you haven't been reading in the word every day, you don't know that the king or the royalty is supposed to have their own copy of the word, which most in the United States do have more than one. But you're supposed to read every day. You're supposed to read at least two times a day in the covenant. And you're supposed to meditate. That's besides what you read. You're also supposed to study. That's besides what you meditate, besides what you read. And if you're not doing those things, there's some things you're not going to know when you need to know it. And if you are doing those things, you'll know what you need to know. And also, there will come times when the word will talk to you and the word will stand up in you and you didn't know that you knew that. And I've had that happen to me a lot. My first time to Jerusalem, God was showing me situations that you don't have in the United States. And for all the different circumstances, uh, and I'm one that, that I go through a lot of peculiar circumstances, uncommon, you know, the things which, uh, how does the scripture say that, uh, uh, things that are common to man, and I go to through things that are not common, and God has taught me both, and then my first trip to Jerusalem, oh my gosh, there were things that just I did not understand, and yet the word would stand up in me, because from, now that my first trip was uh, 2005, 
Now, from 1968, God had taught me some things and some habits to have in his word. He taught me when I didn't know. I mean, I was just, just a baby and I didn't know. But he taught me to have my mind in perfect peace. He taught me that he does that. And he taught me about my mind. He taught me several things. And I want to show you some things here that God has given you the context that he's letting you know that there's going to be some what I call crazy stuff. And I'll, I will keep you. This isn't the time where you're going to keep you. And that doesn't mean you don't have those scriptures ready, uh, that, that those scriptures on peace. It doesn't ha mean that you don't have those scriptures ready to keep your heart and your mind right before the Lord. Now look at verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. Now, there's a song and Judah. Judah is particularly a praise. Now, Judah is, a, is of royalty. By the time we get to Isaiah, there's some things that we already know about that. God has taught us a whole plethora of things, uh, uh, just uh, volumes of things concerning song and concerning Judah, and also concerning that day that God has already taught us many things, so that when he says this, when he has Isaiah prophesying this and writing it, see, we understand things about things said, we understand things about things written by the time we get to uh, uh, prophet Isaiah. In that day shall this song be sung. So the song is written and the song is sung. Don't get mad at people who are composers and and especially if their song gets to be known and if they get to be famous you want to pray for them because they're going to go through some crazy stuff people of excellence when they bring their things of excellence they go through huge tests which have to do with the glory of God and if they don't know it they don't know that they're to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations count it all joy. That's because of the peace that you have, because you know how to sing a song. David went through all kinds of, well, here again, my phraseology, crazy stuff, but he knew how to encourage himself in the Lord, in Yahweh, in God of covenant, in the God who he know, you know who's taking care of you. So in that day, shall this song be sung? That means it's written and it's known. It's not just a song that you have in your heart. You see, that is another scripture, making melody in my heart. Oh, yes, but the song that is sung in the land of Judah, that means everybody knows this song. Sometimes uh, you'll write a song, for those of you who are writers and are minstrels, you'll write a song and it'll sound like it's been here forever, probably because it has and God just gave it to you from heaven. But uh, he says in the land of Judah, that is in the land of royalty and in the land of praise, in the land of the praisers. Those are the things that God has set so that when you see these things, you automatically know that that's the background, the nucleus of what he's talking about. And he says, we have a strong city and salvation. Now, here it is in italics. Will God appoint for walls and bul bulwarks? Now, walls uh, protect and bulwarks not only protect, but that's where you hold the ammunition. So that means that there's some fighting going on. Yeah, he'll keep you in perfect peace. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be some fights. And then he says, open ye the gates. Now, when there's bulwarks, you're not opening the gates, except to, to let out some of the army, perhaps. But walls, no. Walls are for the watchers. Walls are for uh, those kinds of things. And, and walls are, are, well, actually, the gates of the walls are where the government is kept. So open ye the gates that the righteous nation, which keepeth truth, may enter in. Now when he's talking, the righteous nation, uh, what is it? Um, blesses the nation who's, who's God. I'm not thinking of the whole scripture. But the nation who walks in righteousness. And he's talking about the righteous nation. Let me look up righteousness here. Uh, but that's a, phrase, a phraseology that God uses, not just righteous by itself, if you look it up by itself, but righteous nation is a whole thing that God has already given. And uh, I don't know why my, my uh, thing is moving slow, but sadiq, that is lawful, that is just, and that is righteous. 
So it's not enough. We of America, we're saying it these days that we're a nation of laws. It's not enough to be a nation of laws. You have to be just. Yeah, uh, how did God tell, uh, tell was it, um, I, uh, was it Micah, I think he said? He had shown thee, O oh man, uh, what is required of thee to love mercy, to do justice, to walk humbly. And uh, I will let you know that that isn't a specific order. Somebody poo-pooed me about that and just threw that off. But, oh, no, it doesn't have to be so ordered. You don't have to be so strict. And you don't have to be so lawful and so about the letter. Listen, if you love mercy and you can do justice, justice by itself, if, if God was only just, all of us would have died and we wouldn't have Jesus Christ. But because he loved mercy, his, the lamb is slain from the foundation of the earth so that when justice could be done and when death is required, death is what the payment was. But we didn't have to pay it because God loved mercy and saved us through Jesus Christ who paid the debt. He'll keep you in perfect peace. Isaiah 26. told you that by the time we get to Isaiah, God has already taught us many, many, many things about what the prophet is going to say. One of the things that we know by the time we get to Isaiah or the prophets, and I know that in, in Bible college, in Sunday school, even in, in seminary, you're taught uh, an order of scripture. And yet in Luke, God let us know that the Hebrew canon is the order of scripture that God honors. When he said the law, the prophet, and the Psalms. And we like, to, we like to break it up into four parts, not just three. And it makes us miss some things. When you use the order that God gave, you're going to have the things in the order that God gave with the strength that he gave and with the victories that he's given, and you won't be missing. And I want you to see here that in, in this chapter, it is Yahweh, God of covenant, who keeps talking. That's important. That's important to know who's talking. And that's whether or not you've entered into covenant with him. I'm sorry to say that to some of us who think that, uh, yes, Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by him. But you know what? It doesn't mean that the Father hasn't come to you. It doesn't mean that Jesus hasn't come to you. Remember, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Some of us don't even realize that that has to do with the royal priesthood that he already gave through Judah um, to know that uh, that uh, that door is the door of royalty and the door of praise. Some of us don't even recognize that when we get to Revelation. But what I want you to understand is that Elohim, the first name that God reveals himself by, is the one who ordained five things, five being the number of grace, he ordained time, order, place, position, purpose. 
in the beginning. Before you even get to understand that he created anything, before you even hear Elohim created, in the beginning, you have time. I'll use this hand so you can see better. Time, order, place, position, purpose. And then God uses that a good 30 some times, I think 34, but 34 times before he even begins to reveal himself as Yahweh Elohim. And I know that we're, we're way past that now. We've grown up and we just use Yahweh by itself. But when you get to Isaiah, you have already understood some of these things. So that when he's talking to you as Yahweh, you understand some things that Jesus tells us as he walks as the Messiah, as he walks as Yeshua. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, even to the ends of the earth. That thing got established when the first time just Yahweh was used by itself. It was Eve. She left off Yahweh Elohim. God didn't reveal that of himself. He revealed Yahweh Elohim. Not just Yahweh by itself. And they had messed up. You know, Adam and Eve fell and the curse had come. And, and she had understood the promise from Yahweh Elohim. And she understood we get to see it later that she understood the Yahweh part, that God is keeping covenant. He hasn't just left us. He kicked us out of the garden, but he didn't kick us out of his purpose. And so she knew that she was going to have a son, that through her was going to come a son. She didn't know that that son is way later to Jesus Christ and, and that there was going to be <coughs> uh, uh, sons to affirm the covenant that Yahweh is yet keeping. But she said, I have a, a man of Yahweh. And she left off Elohim. Now, she needed the time, order, place, position, and purpose. She needed all of that. Not just the covenant. It is by Elohim. So that when a creative thing needs to be spoken, through faith we understand. It tells us in uh, uh, the, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11.3. Through faith we understand. Now, I'm, I'm shortening it there just to let you know that faith is where understanding comes from. Faith is where you know the will of the Lord. And the rest of that, bringing it to you little by little, he says, through faith we understand that the worlds, plural, were framed, not just made, framed. You see, in the beginning, God made, he made, he made, he said, he fashioned when you read in Genesis. And God is letting you know that he framed the thing first then he speaks it so through faith we understand not through Nugan knowledge because he tells you here that that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind that's your under your understanding that's your your knowledge uh that's your your uh imagination uh the the things that you've learned all of that that we normally uh have to do with now that's your concepts and remember, I already helped you to understand. That's whether you understand or misunderstand. That's whether God gave you the revelation of, of the what's now for now or let you know like Isaiah, he was uh, prophesying things yet to come. And you can expect it in your lifetime and yet four or five hundred years it took for our favorite prophecy of the virgin shall conceive. But when you expect it in your lifetime, in your generation, and in your right now, you can misunderstand and you can call yourself standing on the word, standing on what you know, and then wonder why things haven't gone the way that you believed. Because it's through faith that you understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God so that the things which uh, are made were not made by things which do appear. The things that we're looking at, no, God made it from nothing. And I'm not talking about Big Bang. So I want to uh, go on. This perfect peace. When you, when you take out the italics, it gives the emphasis that God wants us to have with this. And that is, it is God. And he will. He definitely will. He is faithful. He will do this. There's not a question. There's not a, a, a speed bump, a, a skip in it. He will keep he will keep. Nasar. He will keep. He will protect. He will maintain uh, he, at the core and at the, at the 
whole thing. He will besiege if it needs to be besieged. Uh, he will observe. Some things are by observance. Uh, but he will do this. And if you're not upholding it, he will uphold his word. And then he says, in, and I love that uh, uh, when it's the, the Greek, I, I don't know. I wish I had my Hebrew here with me. But you want to understand that he's talking about shalom, peace. That is political peace. That's physical peace. That's social peace. That's, um, uh, did I say physical? Your health and your wholeness. That's your financial peace. That's your uh, relational peace. Every way that every way realm dimension that there needs to be peace. That's your military peace. God will he he's that's shalom in that sense with the uh, actually I wonder uh, I wish I had a board uh, to to show you it written out. Uh, but that peace. But he said perfect peace. That's what that shalom written that kind of way. What he's talking about. And then whose mind, I already gave you, that's your imagination, what you understand, what you misunderstand. That's what you've learned, and including what you haven't learned. And then stayed. You see, God wants you to understand that this is a matter of, uh, this, isn't, this isn't where you can flip-flop and go back and forth. This isn't this. This is what you've taken hold of. And that taking hold brings you in favor, even when the circumstances are not favorable. Rather political, rather military, rather crime, rather health, whatever it is. Uh, he wants you to understand that. That he has established, uh, that's samak, samak. He has established this thing. And, and it, it's a rest unto itself. It's a standing, whether you need to rest or whether you need to stand. Whether you need to stay or whether you need to walk. He has given you that. He's given you that. You are you are stayed. That's you're in the right place, and he is doing that. Now I want to show you that he says in that day. What day are we talking about? Uh, oh, well, before I move to that, I want you to understand that all through here he's talking Yahweh, 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 God of Covenant, God of Covenant. Trust in the Lord forever, uh, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. He keeps talking Yahweh, 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 and the one where we have. The double translation, it's because it's Yah, Yahweh. Huh. And uh, uh, go through the verse and even just glance through and you'll see the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, or, oh Lord, oh Lord. It's Yahweh, 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 God of covenant. He wants you to understand that he who ratifies the covenant is keeping the covenant and he's got all the circumstances. Now he said in that day, I want you to understand this kind of the same way that you have Elohim spoken in the beginning. Uh, a good 30, I think it's 34 times. You can go count it for yourself. And uh, and then he brings Yahweh Elohim, and, that, and he brings that several times. Watch. In that day, in the previous verse, God is talking about what kind of day. Because it's some, some circumstances that most of us don't want that trial. Most of us don't want that test. Most of us don't want it like he says in the 23rd Psalm, that thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Most of us want that table at the banquet and at the peaceful place where there's nothing but friends. But he says, O Lord, O Yahweh, so we're in Yahweh, God of covenant, thou art my Elohim, time, order, place, position, purpose, the God who created he did all of that. He ordained time, order, place, position, purpose before he created, before he spoke and framed. And he says, O oh, Yahweh, God of covenant, thou art my Elohim. I will exalt thee. So we're back to this Yahweh Elohim. I will praise thy name. I do a, a name of God a day. I have a Bible names of God.com and the Bible names of God.com where I show you uh, uh, the different names of God and what he wants us to understand in each of them and what he, um, not just the definition, but to understand how we are to walk as him, even as he, as it says in, in uh, one of the little epistles of, of John, even as he, when we see his name and see the circumstance and see when he did what he did, we understand how we are being made in his image and he made us in charge and gave us dominion. And we get to see how we're to walk that. 
the perfect peace. He's the one we're stayed on and he moves us in these things when we understand when we don't understand like the example I gave you of, of uh, Samuel's parents or uh, we have to be in covenant remember I, I refer a lot of times you want to go look at it in, in Exodus when Moses had the burning bush experience saw the glory of God but uh, for a moment also saw the hinder parts of God I always uh, have a course where I show you that God said yes and he said no when God said, when he, Moses said, I want to see your glory, he said yes, and then he said no. And he did the yes, and he did the no. Uh, that's a whole other course. But here we're looking at the Yahweh Elohim. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. That means you have to know not just uh, Shem, uh, not just Shem, uh, the, the one who's conspicuously uh, in there, an individually place of honor and authority and character, place of renown. That's the name. But he's, he's letting you know that you will praise him. And that is whatever way he is revealing himself. And then for thou hast done wonderful. Now another place he lets us know his name is wonderful. Because he is. He's all of that. Any attribute is also a name uh, of him. And he, is, he does it by these different attributes of himself. And he knows when what needs to be applied. When we're going through our circumstance, we're usually so full of the circumstance that we need him to take over. We need him to be the one who keeps us in perfect. I want you to see all the different kinds of circumstances. And, and I'm telling you, my vernacular is crazy circumstances. Life circumstances that mess up your mind if you don't keep your mind stayed on him. This is why Isaiah 26.3 says it that way. So I'm going to take you through the verse before. Because remember the first verse of 26. We're looking at 26.3. But the first verse he says in that day. So what kind of day? What kind of day? Look at this, and I'm going to run through this because we only have a few minutes, but I want you to see how awful the circumstance if you're living through them. 
O Lord, thou art my Elohim. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. Uh, for thou hast done wonderful uh, counsels of old, faithfulness and truth. Now, remember, I already let you know that those are some of the names of God. Wonderful, uh, faithful, truth. And for thou hast made a city a heap. When you live through that, that a city becomes a heap, it'll mess with you. you it, it is Yahweh, God of covenant, who's going to let you know what's going on because you won't know what's going on. A defense city, a ruin. This is the place that's supposed to be the strongest place. The place that's supposed to be the place of refuge. He says, uh, it turned to ruin. A palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. And then when, when you see these kind of things, you don't know what's going on. But he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You understand? He's the one who's keeping you through these crazy circumstances. Watch this. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. They won't even know. And, and I want you to also understand when strong, terrible nations fear thee, it doesn't mean that they're going to not challenge you. It doesn't mean that they're not going to not try to annihilate you. You need to understand that. And if you don't understand that, he's still keeping you in perfect peace when somebody's coming after you. Um, Prophet Jeremiah didn't always get it. He knew that God told him he would take care of him, and he didn't realize that getting thrown in the dungeon, God was taking care of him. I share with you often how that um, cannibalism had started to happen, and, and he wouldn't have made it. People were killing each other. Uh, I'm talking about their own people were killing each other. And he's down in the dungeon getting bread and water, prison food. Barely enough to keep alive, but enough to keep alive. God was taking care of him. But it didn't look like it. It didn't feel like it. If all you know is, I spoke your word and I was sent to jail. And then I stayed with your word and I'm sinking in the mire and the rats are running around. You don't know all the chaos that's going on the outside. He's keeping you in perfect peace. Jeremiah with his sweet, soft-hearted soul, wouldn't have been able to take it that the children of Israel had turned on each other in various kinds of ways because the circumstances got so bad. Oh, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So when you go through these kind of circumstances, I'm looking at 25 to show you the kinds of circumstances because there are, are awful. And if you're living through them, you need to know Yahweh is God of covenant. He hasn't let you down. He's faithful. He's moving in truth. Uh, verse um, verse 3. Therefore shall strong people glorify thee. I was looking, uh, listening to um, our president right now. The uh, If you look at this later, it's going to be a different president. Uh, but uh, saying that, uh, be strong. But then he's perpetrating on the weak. Perpetrating on the, the poor, perpetrating on those in distress. That's not what strong is when we're talking the word of God. And by the time you get to Isaiah, God has already defined what strong is. So he says here, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress. Strength doesn't mean you're, uh, everything's always going good. <laughs> His strength to the needy. I know that there are classes of people that like to look down on the needy <coughs> and want them to all get over it and, and come on out and, and stop always looking for a handout. Listen, he's a strength to the needy in his distress. Father God, look after the, the uh, woman that called me homeless and, and needing a place for her children and her grandchild and make a way strength to the needy in his distress in a, in a shelter that's going to put you out and make you homeless all over again God is strength to the needy in his distress a refuge from the storm doesn't mean there's not a storm Jesus looked at the great storm it was a great storm the, the word of God tells us and then he said, be muzzled. And then there was a great calm. Now, um, the, the Greek is be muzzled, but we know the song, peace be still. Okay. When you go read it in, in your King James, he said, peace. Perfect peace. There was a great calm. 
He told him to have faith. He told him, don't be afraid. It wasn't false evidence appearing real. It was a real storm. A real storm could have capsized him, could have killed him. But when he says, don't be afraid, you have perfect peace. Because he's the king of peace. He's the prince of peace. And so, he says, uh, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat for those uh, children, uh, those ice children being separated and being in the desert and in the heat, uh, whether, they, whether they have generators to make a way for them or not, God will be your generator. He will generate a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible one is as a storm against the wall. That is bad, 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 extremely bad circumstance. And he will keep you in perfect peace. You'll sing a song. Oh, yeah. How does he say it? In 26, in that day, shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint the walls for the bulwarks. Now, I want to go back and show you some of these awful circumstances you see, when we see perfect peace, we think it means perfect circumstances. And that is not what he's talking about unless you understand that those perfect circumstances are also working out his will, moving his judgment, making it so that he can show that he is just in his judgment, not just judging in his judgment. And then he says, thou, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers. So when you hear all this noise, whether it's military noise, whether it's social noise, whether it's political noise, whether it's spiritual noise, and you think you're hearing ghosts, whatever kind of noise of strangers, as he says, he'll bring it down, he'll bring it down, he'll bring it down. That's what he said. That's verse 5, if you, uh, Isaiah 25, 5. The heat in a dry place. He's talking about this heat again, because there's a lot of heat. Uh, uh, there's heat right now in the in our uh, political system in the United States of America, the Republic. Hmm. Lord God, hear us, save us from ourselves, and keep us in perfect peace. Keep the national mind in these crazy times. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. It doesn't mean there's not some terrible ones. And when God's talking terrible ones, they're bigger and better than you are. Go through uh, uh, Second Chronicles, Chronicles 20. Whole bunch of circumstances. God told me, <laughs> it's not time to be tired. There's a, uh, and he gave me uh, 2020 to have 2020 vision because the victory is the Lord's. And, and after they had the victory through their praise, God jumped the enemy. And then he said it took three days to clean up the spoil. You can't be so tired. You're not going to have to fight. You need your strength so that you can clean up the spoil. Because he's going to keep you in perfect peace. And his mi your mind, for all the things you know, all the things you don't know, all the things you understood, all the things you learned. You see, the Apostle Paul let us know, uh, being um, a, a chief and... and, and and a Hebrew of Hebrews that it's good to have learned. But then he also lets you know that all that stuff is done because it is God, the God of truth, God who is faithful, God who is wonderful, who is all and does all. It is Lord Yahweh. So he says, uh, verse 6 of 25, And in this mountain shall Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts, make unto all people a feast of fat things. You see, there's going to be all that awful stuff ahead of time, but there's going to be the feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. And God is not stuttering here. Remember, I told you, I'm a theologian. I'll let you know that when God said the thing twice, it's because it's not going to be another way. It's going to be just that way, exactly that way. When he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly, I say unto you. When he says a thing twice, it is that way completely, that way fully, no other way, period. And, and so in that verse, he said that thing twice. God is not stuttering. And also, uh, um, 
He does it, and then he does it magnified. He does it, and then he does it defined. He does it in the, the general, and then he does it in the very particular. You need to understand that when he does a thing twice. And then he says, he will destroy in this mountain the, the face of the covering cast over all people. You know, you're putting on a mask and you're putting on a facade. He says, that'll be destroyed. Whether it's physical, whether it's uh, material, whether it's uh, personality, whatever it is, whether it's political, whatever the facade is, he will destroy in this mountain. Now, when he said, now the mountain is a place of things that rule. The mountain is a place of things that have authority. So, it, like right now, I'm thinking of all the political mess that's going on in our country and going on around the world. He says, he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. All of that facade. And the veil that is spread over all nations. Oh, God will talk political. Please understand, he's talking political right here. He's not just talking the salvation Part of how God does salvation, you remember, no man comes unto the Father but by Jesus, but we forget that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When we're moving in God the Father, it's over the world, it's nations, it includes the political and the governmental. Remember of Jesus as it, uh, being a father, remember, in, in Isaiah, part of the revelation he gave Isaiah that he shall be called Wonderful Everlasting Father. There's going to be some things that he will take care of as Father. He will swallow up death in victory. Now see, we understand these things about Jesus already. They didn't understand it quite that way then. They understood it of Yeshua Messiah, and some understood misunderstood it to be of the nation. And that's not a total misunderstanding. God has given those things of the nation. So no matter how full or not full your understanding is, he will keep you, him, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. He'll do the keeping for what you understand, what you don't understand. Just keep it in him. Keep it in his word, and it will be in him, not just in your doctrine and in your favorite thing, but in his word. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, Isaiah 26, 3. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding standing and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to his glory, his virtue, and his praise. You are elected to his power, his loving kindness, and his grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God.